Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to The Edge Church. My name is Ryan Van Campen. I'm the production director here. We are excited to have you with us this week as we enter week five of our sermon series, Vintage Faith. This week, we're gonna do a detailed dive into the life of Abraham, who's considered by many to be the father of the faith. But before we get started with today's uh, sermon and worship time, we want to uh, give you uh, just a couple ministry updates. You know, right now um, we are trying to respond to the hurricane uh, that's recently happened in Florida and just the, the destruction that it's caused down there. So we do have a special giving campaign going on right now um, where we're looking for not only just financial contributions to help those people impacted, but also cleaning supplies. We have a couple people from the Edge Church that will be uh, part of a crew going down there to help with those relief efforts. So if you would like to contribute to our hurricane relief efforts, go ahead and, head and contact Hillary Start, our church administrator. Her information is up on the screen right now. And one more, um, but instead of hearing from me about this particular ministry, we thought we'd let the ministry directors address you directly. So we're about to hear from uh, good friends of ours, Aaron and John. Hi everyone, my name is Jean Dodien Dwyer. And my name is Erin, and this is Grace. Yeah. And we wanted to share a little bit of, about a ministry that we have in Burundi called the Authentic Center. So how did we start this ministry? We of course never planned this ministry, but God brought it to us on our doorstep. Um, there were a group of street kids sleeping on jo the porch of John's studio. And we just asked God, God, what do you want us to do? Because in Burundi, street children are seen as a thief. thieves, yeah. the least of the least, um, no good, mm -hmm. and um, as kids who choose to be on the streets. When in reality, most children on the streets have grown up in poverty with other um, difficult situations at home that has led to them being on the streets. So we took this before the Lord and asked God, God, direct us, lead us. We're open to doing whatever. And it didn't make sense in the timing of our lives, but we really felt that God wanted us to do something. Mm -hmm. And God slowly led us and opened doors that we um, open a house. So we have seven boys and we've been led to support younger boys. So boys between 11 and 14 years old who who have no place to sleep at yeah. night mm -hmm. and boys who don't have the most difficult behavior who are open to changing at this time. So we provide or we provide food, a place for them to live. Um, we, they go to school. They have, in, they're encouraged in their gifts and their talents and they're part of um, a church community and church family. Yeah. Our goal is that these um, kids would reach their fullest potential spiritually, physically, emotionally, and be people who would contribute to society in different ways mm. and be self, um, could self provide for themselves in the future. So what is our long-term goal, our hope? Well, right now in this season, we feel that God wants us to stay committed to these seven boys. And long-term speaking, we hope to start a school that would be a vocational school that would allow for poor people or poor boys or and girls who couldn't go to school otherwise to develop skills that would allow them to get jobs. Mm -hmm. And we know that some of the boys that we support and work with, they may not be as focused on academics, but a vocational school would be an opportunity where they could develop their abilities and skills to then provide for themselves and their families. Yeah. So uh, we are ask, or hoping that you would just perfectly think about coming and working um, or asking what the Lord wants you to do. There are different ways that you can partner with us. First is prayer by praying, praying for mm -hmm. the boys that they continue yeah. to grow and develop mm -hmm. um, into who God wants them to be. Yeah. The, and then also that God would provide the right people that um, come along the boy alongside the boys in Burundi. The other way is financially. Um, you could give a one-time gift or commit month to monthly giving. Um, in this season, the cost of food 
has increased in Burundi, so we need to raise our, our base, our monthly base, to help um, the ministry Basically, continue yeah, to yeah. run. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is if God is leading you to come over short term, long term, forever, whatever God would lay on your heart, please let us know. There's different yeah. ways you could um, just be, hang out with the boys. You could encourage the boys. You mm -hmm. could teach the boys a skill, mm -hmm. even English, um, whatever God lays on your heart. Um, so we thank you. you just just to visit them and hang out with those boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Edge Church. This morning, as you are in your house churches or maybe at home, I, I just invite you this morning to just ready your heart. Ready your heart for whatever the Lord wants to do in it, whether that means you, you stand up or whether that means you're kneeling on the ground. I, I just pray that, that whatever it is that you do, that it would just be an overflow from from your spirit, an overflow of, of your spirit saying, God, you are God and I am not. And we would worship from that place as one unified body, just singing this uproarious chorus together. And so why don't you sing with me? I count on one thing Same God that never fails And I fail me now Won't fail me now In the waiting Same God that never lays Working all things out Working all things out
I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again It's all that I have is a It's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing Alleluia, Alleluia. I've got one response And I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again singing got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. my hands praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah I know it's not much but I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah,
God of Abraham, God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven to just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will pray your name great is your faithfulness to me God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, the word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. Come to pass. Well, great is your faithfulness to me, and great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. You'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. You'll never let me down. You'll never let your faithfulness to me and great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name and great is your faithfulness faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me
Father, I just pray this morning that we would trust in the promises that you have for us. That we would put our hope in you, our firm foundation, our solid rock. Would we build our lives upon the promise that you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to you, and welcome once again to The Edge Church. My name is Stephen Van Den, and I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, So glad to have you joining with us today as we continue on in our sermon series that we're calling Vintage Faith. Uh, In this series, we are walking together through what the Bible calls the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, looking back at the lives and stories of some of Scripture's great heroes of faith to see what God wants to speak into our lives through theirs. And I hope today that you're ready. I hope you've come excited to open God's word. And I hope you brought your Bible with you. Um, It's one of the things that we've been encouraging you to do and to dig into God's word, that you're reading the word of God for yourself, not just listening to a pastor or somebody online has to say about God's word, but you're actually listening for what it is that God wants to speak directly to you through his word. Um, that, that, that you know that God wants to speak to you, that you know that God will um, because he wants you to know his voice. And so, so that's my prayer for you this morning. My prayer is that, that you would hear the Lord speak to you through his word today, that God would minister to your heart, that he minister, minister to your spirit, and, and really that, that the Lord would build each of us up in faith today. And so I'm gonna pray for us. If you would just pray with me and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. God, thanks for just another opportunity to gather, another opportunity, Lord, to be in your presence, another opportunity, God, to open your word and to to hear you speak. God, I pray that you would just open up our ears today to hear from you. Holy Spirit, that you would move in each and every heart today. God, that you would give us eyes to see, Lord, what it is that you would have for us to, to see and recognize and grab hold of today, Lord, that, that, God, you would plant in our hearts, Lord, the things that are for us. Lord, just commit this time to you. Lord, invite you to have your way in it, have your way through me, God, as I share your word. We love you, we bless you. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, in your name we pray, amen. Well, go ahead and open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to focus in on verses eight through 10, and our guide for our faith journey today will be none other than Abraham. And uh, Abraham is, is known as the father of the faith, faith for, for all you sports fans. Abraham would be the goat, okay? Abraham is the goat of the faith. In fact, when you read the scriptures, you'll find that, that Abraham is one who is primarily used as an illustration of faith. Galatians 3 verse 7 actually tells you that, that when you follow the Lord, when, that you're one of his heirs when you walk by faith. And so, Let's look at Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. It says this. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Today, we're going to focus in on three things 
uh, about this faith journey that we learn from Abraham's walk with God. I'm going to give you three L's to hopefully help you remember this story. And here it is. The, a faith journey with God requires a, a, a leaving, a living, and a looking. Okay, let me say that again. A faith journey with God requires a leaving, a living, and a looking. Let's let's start with the, the leaving here. Verse 8 says that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Now, now the whole story about Abraham's journey is found in the book of Genesis. It begins in chapter 12. And at this time, Abraham is actually known as Abram. God will change his name later. But, but Abraham's been living with his father and his family in a place known as Haran, which is part of Mesopotamia. It's part of the Babylon Empire. Empire. Uh, it was a pagan culture where, where the religion of humanism, man-centered religion, was really first established. In, in fact, in Genesis 11, it tells us that, that Babylon is where the Tower of Babel was built. If you remember that story, it says that, that the people of the, the world, of the nation, of the land, they, they came together as one, right? And, and they wanted to create their own civilization. It says that they, they built in the center of their city this tower called a, a ziggurat. It was like a worship city people, okay? It was these people that gathered and said, listen, we don't need God. We, we've got intelligence. We, we've got big brains and reason and, and science and skills. And so, so we can build our own tower to the heavens. And in fact, we will build a tower so high that we'll get ourselves to God. This is the culture that Abraham was a part of. This is where he was from. And then in chapter 12, God comes to Abraham and says to him in verses 1 through 4, it says, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he sent out from Haran. So, so God shows up here, and he, and he says to Abraham, listen, Abraham, I have something more for you, okay? I have a purpose and a, and a destiny and a plan for your life. I want to bless you, and I want to bless through you. But in order for this to happen, you're going to have to leave where you are and go to a place I will show you. Th this is the first great follow me from God in human history. And we know that through the line of Abraham, Jesus Christ will eventually come and Jesus will show up saying these very words, follow me. Follow me is really the call of God to each and every one of us. And notice here that this call comes with a promise, a promise of, of blessing, of a work that God wants to do in and through the life of Abraham and in and through your life too. But also notice here that, that God says to Abraham, in order to follow me to where I'm taking you, you're going to have to leave where you are. God says, you need to leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Now, now, now this is really significant because Abraham's father was a man named Terah. And, and what we know about Terah is from J Joshua chapter 24. And it tells us there that, that Terah is an idol worshiper and so as his father was. In fact, in Jewish literature, it says that Terah was an idol maker. So, so the people of Abram's family, they, they were worshiping false gods. They worshiped the gods of their own making, as did the culture that they were a part of. And God says to Abraham, listen, in order for you to follow me, if you're going to follow me and you're going to walk in my blessing into your destiny and your purpose, then you're going to have to leave your idolatry and your worldliness. The same actually is true for us. In fact, in 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, it says it like this. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's love is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The, the journey of faith is one of leaving what isn't God or of him to pursue him in all that is. It's a turning away from sin and a turning towards righteousness. It's a turning away from self and turning towards Jesus. In fact, one of the ways that you know that you're growing in faith as a Christian is when your passion for the world and its desires is lessening and your passion for God and his desires is growing. 
God, God's saying here, he's saying, listen, you can't have the world and me. You, you can't be of this world and of me. To follow me means leaving the way of the world behind. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, the very next uh, chapter from 11, uh, the scriptures will say it like this. They'll say, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run the race that has been marked out for us. See, what we have to know is that God has a race for us. God has a race for you. God has a purpose and a plan and a, and a destiny for your life and for mine. But, but in order for us to get to that finish line, there are some things that we need to throw off and let go of and leave behind. These idols in our lives. You know, so often when we think about idols, we tend to think about like little figurines or statues that people bow to. But an idol is really anything or, or anyone that isn't God. It, that, that's ruling and reigning in your life, sitting on the throne of your heart. It's really just a false God. This is why uh, the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments given by God to his people in, in Exodus chapter 20 uh, are him saying, listen, I'm the Lord your God and you shall have no other gods before me. And he says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not toler tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now, Listen, this isn't God saying here that there are actually are other gods. This is God saying that either you will worship the one true God or you will create a God substitute for yourself. You will actually have some other functional Lord and Savior for your life that you give yourself to. An idol is really anything that's more fundamental to your, to your happiness, uh, to your purpose, to your identity than God. It's something else that commands your obedience, that commands your thoughts and your affections. It's this thing that you need to have in order to be fulfilled and can't live without. This really can be even good things that we make God things, right? Like, like money is an example of a good thing, but, but making money the purpose and priority of your heart and life makes it a God thing. Uh, relationships are a great thing. Spouses, children, all great things, but, but making any of them an ultimate priority and purpose and pursuit of your heart and life makes them an idol. If you aren't really sure what your idols might be, consider this. A ask yourself maybe questions like this. Who, who or what is it that I love the most? L like, what do you give yourself most to? What, 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 what do you give your time and energy and affection and resources? Like, like what is it that consumes your life? Or, or maybe this question, like, who or what is it that you seek after or pursue most? Or maybe it's this, it's, it's what is it that you fear most? Is, it, is, is what, what I fear most God or do I really feel, fear others? Do I fear the opinions of others? Do I, do I fear that they're not having their approval? Or maybe it's this question, who or what do you trust the most? All the idol, are there idols in your life currently that, that God is calling you to leave behind in order to follow him? Is there sin that you've been clinging to? Where it says, listen, we throw off hindrances and the sin that easily entangles. Is there sin in your life? Is there lust and pride and, and selfishness, those kinds of things? Is there, is there things like unforgiveness or bitterness? some kind of identity that you've taken on apart from just being a son or daughter of God that needs to be left and walked away from so that you can fully walk into all that God has for you. A faith journey requires a leaving, but secondly, it also requires a living. Verse nine in Hebrews 11 says, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. It says, listen, Abraham, he lived in tents with his children like he was a stranger in somewhere foreign land. In other words, Abraham did not get comfortable and settle in somewhere, but he was always ready to move to wherever God was leading him next. Our, our faith journey is meant to be fluid and not static. It's a movement with God and you can't be following someone while not moving. Gal Galatians 5.25 says it like this, says if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. In other versions, it actually says to, to let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. 
The, the Spirit of God is constantly leading us into more of what God has for us, more of His character, more of His power, more of His purpose, more. But we have to move with God in order to receive it. The Apostle Paul, he understood this very thing. In Philippians chapter 3, he talks about following God and pursuing him. And he says this in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all of this or have ta- arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I, I love this from Paul because of everybody, like Paul's kind of the man of the New Testament, right? Like, like Paul is this guy who Jesus spoke directly to. He's the guy that Jesus commissioned himself to be one of his apostles to the Gentiles. He's this guy who writes most of the New Testament. And yet this same guy comes and says, listen, for all that God has done in my life, for all that God has done through me, I still haven't arrived yet. There's still more for me. I still have more to get. I still have more to do. I still have more to learn. I'm still growing. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if that's true for Paul, that that's likely true for you and I too. There's more for us. So, So there's this constant movement that we're to have with God to take hold of all that he has for us. In the same way that that our physical bodies need movement in order to grow and thrive, so too our spiritual being needs movement in order to grow and thrive. You you can't get from where you are to where God wants to take you by standing still. You you can't just do all the same things that you've always done or that you used to do and expect that you're gonna come to some new place in God. It requires movement. To, To walk by faith means that you're moving with God. Let me ask you this. Are, are you moving with God? Are, are, are you growing in him? Are you in pursuit of all that he has for you? Or have you got comfortable where you are? Have you just settled in and just been doing the same old thing? I, I don't know if you know this or not, but faith and comfort don't mix too well. Because you don't need God to do what's easy and comfortable. I, I like to consider in my own life a question that I like to ask is is really like, what am I doing right now that scares me? What what am I doing right now that that, that if God doesn't show up, I don't know how this happens? What's happening in my life? How have I positioned myself where it's like, God, I absolutely need you and without you, I'm I'm sort of sunk here. Because when I study the scriptures and I look at the people that God lifts up, I realize that not one of them ever took the easy road. None of them lived a comfortable life, but they lived in a way that God had to come through for them. Remember, God tells Abraham, he says, listen, like leave. And he says, go to a land that I will show you. Now, now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I I just think, why? Why, why? Why God, why don't you just tell him? Right? Like, like, why can't he just know right now? Why, why, why can't you just show him here at the very beginning? Well, I think there's two reasons. Two reasons for why God doesn't show Abraham the whole picture. And, and the first reason is because perhaps if he knows how far the journey is and the difficulties he'll face along the way, he wouldn't go. Some of us today find ourselves in this place where we haven't arrived yet to the place we thought we were going. We haven't got to that place that we had envisioned and and we haven't arrived at the the life that we had planned for, right? And really it's ultimately because it's not your plan. It's on this journey ultimately that we find this truth about God that so many of us struggle with. And, 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 And the idea here is this, that one of God's greatest workrooms in our life is the waiting room. One of God's greatest workrooms in our life is the waiting room. It's the place where God is prepared. It's not, it's not where you're being prepared for what, or where God's preparing the thing that he has for you. He's just preparing you for the thing that he has for you. Are you with me? Right, so, so, so that you're able to receive and walk in what God has for you. And the waiting room is the place where God's developing you in such a way that you can hold what he wants to give you. Secondly, I think the reason God doesn't show him the whole picture is because by not showing him the end, Abraham then had to depend on God for each and every step that he took. 
Remember here also that it tells us that Abraham is 75 years old when he leaves from Haran, which means for you, you're never too old to get started, right? That, that no matter how old you are today, God's not done with you yet. Moving with God into the destiny that he has for you, like, like you can do that today. It, c- consider this, right? Like, am I pursuing and prioritizing my own comfort or am I pr- pursuing and prioritizing the Lord? Like, really ask yourself, like, what is it that I'm really after? Am I saying yes to the Lord and what he's calling me into? Or or am I just saying yes to myself? Like, like, does the life that I'm living require dependence upon God and him coming through for me? Or if I'm honest, can I just do all of this myself? Our faith journey requires a leaving and it requires a living. And thirdly and lastly, it requires a looking. Verse 10, Hebrews 11 says, Abraham was was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Wow. Listen, don't don't miss this. Abraham's ability to leave where he was and, and move with God towards what God had promised him was determined by where he looked. It says that he looked forward to the city whose architect and builder is God. That's the heavenly city. So he wasn't going to heaven yet, but he was looking at it. If you want to walk by faith, you need an eternal perspective, looking to heaven while living on earth. So so some of you have probably heard it said that you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Or maybe you've even heard it said that that you could be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. But, but, But simply the desire of God is that you would be looking up while touching down. That, that, that you would have your feet firmly planted on the earth while your eyes are firmly fixed on heaven so that your heavenly perspective is informing your earthly action. Abraham understood something that we need to regularly be reminded of today. And it's simply this, this is not our home. This life, this, this place, it's all temporary. It's, it's fading. It's what the Bible calls a mist here today and gone tomorrow. But Abraham's focus wasn't on here, but on heaven. He was looking forward to another home, an eternal home. And it was his eternal perspective that directed his life on earth. In fact, in Genesis 12 and 13, it tells us that that in each of these places where Abraham went, he built an altar to the Lord where he worshiped God. In each new place, each new season, he built an altar so that he could keep his eyes fixed on the Lord, fixed on heaven while he moved throughout the earth. Worshiping the Lord, gathering together like many of you are doing right now today, reading God's word, praising him with song and with celebration, praying. These are all ways by which we help to keep our eyes set on the Lord and on heaven, to get our eyes off of ourselves, to get our eyes off of our own earthly circumstances and to fix our eyes, to look upon God and to be reminded of eternity. Listen, be careful that you don't get caught up fixing your eyes and focusing your life and your time and your energy and your emotion and your effort on on all that is temporary, on what isn't really your home. 2 Corinthians 4.18 reminds us, says, listen, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's where our focus is meant to be. Look now, look at Hebrews 11 verse 13. It says, it says, all these people, including Abraham, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Abraham, say, is Abraham died in faith, okay? He kept living by faith until the very end. And today, it seems that, that the goal for so many yeah, that even those walking by faith is to get to a place where we just put up our feet and, and get comfortable, where we just finally come to a place where we say, look, it's my time now, right? It, it's time for me to just get comfortable, write my memoirs and do me, right? But this isn't Abraham. Abraham's like, listen, I'm gonna live by faith and follow God all the way to the very end. I pray that that, that would be true of my life. 
that that's the kind of man that I would be, that I, that I would live my life in such a way by faith that, that I'm living by faith until the very end. And Abraham didn't get the reward. He only saw it from a distance. But look at verses 15 and 16. It says, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Abraham, in other words, he's saying, Abraham wasn't looking back. He was looking forward. This reminds me so much, again, of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, where in, in verses 13 14, he says, he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is like, listen, brothers, sisters, right? There may be a lot of things that I do, but let me tell you the one thing that I always make sure that I do, it's I move forward and I don't turn back. I move forward to what God has called me into and I don't look back. Far too many Christians today, I fear, let their past be their great hindrance and barrier to, to keep them from moving forward in the Lord. And, and, and listen to me, this isn't Paul saying here, don't deal with your past, okay? He's not saying like, don't address the things of your past. This is Paul saying, listen, don't make your past your focus. Don't let your past define you because you can't be focused on your past while you walk forward into your destiny. See, with God, the best is always yet to come. So there, there isn't anything that's actually behind you that is better than what God has before you. Just think about that for a second, right? Like, like there is nothing that you have ever lost or had in this life that is greater than was still to come in Christ. So ultimately then, your greatest joy is still in front of you. It's not behind you, it's before you. So stop looking back and look ahead. Shift your focus and set your eyes on Jesus and on eternity. That's the secret to this faith journey. Look at verse 16 in Hebrews 11. It says, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I love that. God is not ashamed to be called their God. I mean, think about that. God, God's like, look, listen, like, look at the life of Abraham. See what a walk of faith looks like. He just followed me wherever I led him, wherever I called him to. He never settled. He never made this earth his focus or his home until his very last breath. He walked by faith. So I'm not ashamed, God says, to be called his God. Wouldn't you love for God to say that about you? I would. I, I, I mean, I just love if God's like, man, I, I just, like Steve, he just lived by faith till the end like Abraham did. I'm just, I'm not ashamed to be called his God. And we know that because Abraham did, we know that because he walked by faith, the scripture says that he and all the peoples of earth, including you and me, were blessed because of his faith. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven, he says, and you will get earth thrown in. Let me just ask you, where is your focus today? Are you fixated on the here and now and spending your life pursuing what will not last? Or are you looking forward to an eternal home and letting the reality of heaven inform and direct your life here on earth. This journey of faith with God is one of leaving, leaving sin and hindrances and idols and all that isn't God and turning towards Jesus and, and living in, by faith, walking with him, keeping in step as we hear by the, with the spirit, right? Listening and obeying and moving as God directs you, dependent upon God for each and every day with eyes fixed forward, looking to heaven and living in light of eternity. 
And that's the prayer for each and every one of you today, that you would live by faith in such a way that your life would be marked by leaving what isn't God, living for what is, and looking ahead to eternity. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for this morning. God, thanks for this time and this moment and your word. God, thank you for the example men like Abraham in the scriptures, Lord, who teach us about what it looks like to follow you by faith. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in each and every heart, God, that you would direct us. Lord, like you did Abraham, Lord, that you would direct us away from the things that aren't you. God, that that we would, Lord, listen and depend upon you. God, that we would walk with you as you call us and direct us and move us, Lord. That we would be in pursuit of you. And God, that you would help us to have eyes that are set on you and looking forward to home and eternity. God, that our lives would be shaped by an eternal perspective. God, move in each and every one of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
of the goodness of God. Hmm. Yeah, Jesus, I pray this morning that we would be sent out as a people who are reminded of your goodness, who know your goodness inside and out, upside and down, so that whatever we face, storms, trials, battles, things that you've even promised us, God, (laughs) that we would stand firm, firm and unshaken in your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. And I I hope and pray that the Lord spoke to you by his word, that he ministered to your heart. And and really that, that that song echoes in your heart today, that you just know and can declare that, God, you have been so faithful and so good to me. So with every breath that I'm able, Lord, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna praise you, God, because of your goodness. As we close, I wanna just leave you with a few questions for you to think through, for you to journal about maybe this week or to discuss in your house church gathering or whoever you're gathered with today. Three questions for you. First question is this. What is something in your life currently, some hindrance or sin or idol that you can identify that you need to leave in order to follow God more fully? Is there something, if you were honest, that you could look at in your life and say, I know this has been a barrier for my pursuit of God and something for me to leave behind? That's the first question. Here's the second question. Would would you describe your current faith journey as moving and growing or stagnant and comfortable? And, and, And what maybe then is one faith step that you could take this week? What would be one step for you to take this week to move towards God and the things that God has for you? That could be a lot of different things, but but maybe that's even just something to pray about and ask the Lord, God, what are you inviting me into? God, what do you have for me? Maybe it's something you already know. Here's the third question. Where's your focus? Are, Are you consumed by the things of earth or are you looking forward towards eternity? And what might you do then this week to help you shift your gaze towards heaven? You know, we talked about how worship is such a great, uh, way by which that we just get reminded of who God is and what God has for us. Maybe that's a place for you this week. But, but what is one way for you this week to help you shift your gaze from, from just the distractions and all the things around you to, to heaven and eternity and the Lord? So there it is, guys. I, I hope and pray you have an incredible week. Uh, pray God would just bless you, minister to you, speak to you, and hope we see you again next week here at The Edge.